Hey everyone, it's me, John, here with another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Feeling a little better every day this week. Thank you so much for all your supportive comments out there. Um, and today's case I wanted to take on because when I looked into it, I found um, a father that is really struggling and a really tough situation uh, to deal with in general that leads to a lot of questions. And I thought it'd be a really good topic for us to share and consider here on the show. So today we are looking into the disappearance of Rosemarie Temperley. And as you can see, this is hosted at the website from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, she went missing just in 2016 on February 2nd. Um, and even though her age now is 21. When she went missing, I believe she was 20 years old. And uh, Nick Mick will actually feature profiles of people up until the age of 21, which is just another way that they're amazing in what they do to try to help these cases. Um, we have a little bit of a different circumstance here with Rose Marie in that she suffers from some developmental issues. Despite the fact that she is 21 years old, uh, some people have said that her mentality might compare to a 13 year old. From this poster, we can see she is missing from Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Uh, her date of birth is August 23rd, 1995. She is a female, white, with blonde hair, brown eyes. She's five foot five, weighs about 120 pounds. Um, they think she still might be in the local area. She might be wearing black framed glasses with pink sides. You can see them in this picture on the left where the pink side starts. And she may also be wearing a wig. Apparently she does occasionally wear um, black as a hair color with wigs. So you might see her, it, there could be other colors as well. Just to get a little idea on where this is, Okmulgee, Oklahoma is a city in Okmulgee County, Oklahoma, United States. The population at the 2010 census was 12,321. It also notes that the population there is shrinking a bit. Uh, it is 38 miles south of Tulsa and 13 miles north of Henrietta. And here on the map, we can see uh, where it is located in the state. Jumping over to NamUs, they have a pretty strong profile on her. It's once again repeating all the information that is a match to what we saw over at uh, Nick Mick's website. A little more detail on the circumstances. Rosemarie Temperley went missing from the North Taft area of Okmulgee in the early morning hours of Tuesday, February 2nd. She is believed to have left the residence between 4 and 6 a.m. And she was living in a home with other uh, developmentally challenged adults. Uh, it seems like, I believe she might have slipped out the window there. Um, we'll get into much more details as, as we crack into this case. But uh, just a real tough situation when you consider the struggle already uh, that she must have been going through, that her family had gone through uh, in bringing her up, and then to have something like this happen where she literally disappears while she's at a location where supposedly she was being monitored uh, 24 hours a day. Um, she basically left in between a couple of check periods where people would come into the room and check and make sure that everyone was was still there and okay. Um, so the family, I believe, is a bit upset at the conditions around her disappearance and how she got out. And I think that's totally understandable. Um, physical characteristics, we got the same thing. Um, they're also noting that she's known to wear colored and black wigs. Um, brown eyes, she has a burn scar in an unknown location, and what is referred to as a stork bite birthmark on the back of her head and neck. She does have her ears pierced. Previously it looks like she might have had her nose and her belly button pierced, but they have healed. She was last seen wearing a gray t-shirt, pink Tweety Bird pajama pants, and tan cowboy boots that were tall. She's possibly wearing a black jacket, maybe carrying an acoustic guitar. Um, apparently when she had left, she took several of her items, her personal belongings with her, and they actually kind of found this trail of the items that was leading away from the home where she was staying. I thought I read on another place that they actually had found the guitar, but um, I would probably rather defer to the information that's posted here at NamUs and say that she probably has her guitar with her. No transportation methods. Uh, she did not drive, which is another interesting twist in her disappearance. Um, they have dental information and charts available. 
uh, DNA sample has been submitted and there is no fingerprint information. One of the tough things about this case for her family has been the fact that she is effectively legally an adult. Um, so when it comes to them getting updates from police, from, for them asking the police to do certain things, the police are admittedly somewhat tied, tied up. There's, there's only so much that they, they can do without impeding on her privacy. Um, for example, even for getting the dental information, I'm not sure how they did that because there are um, HIPAA regulations, basically rules around medical practices for releasing patient information. Uh, somehow they were able to get around that so that they could get that information in. I'm glad they, they did in this case, but um, you know, I understand privacy concerns as well, so I see why those, those rules are in place, but really makes it challenging in this particular instance where you're dealing with an adult that might be a lot more like a minor. It's, it's really just a tough case. It really makes me wonder about some of the lines of the legalities um, in cases like this and how can you protect that person's privacy uh, while still doing the right thing in terms of keeping them safe and making sure that something bad doesn't happen to them like an abduction of some kind. Um, here at NamUs they have many photos of her uh, and I do want to note her appearance does change pretty drastically from some of these photos to others. So um, please do take a look at several of these photos. They have very solid information here on the investigating agency. We've even got a specific investigator. I will have this information in the description box below. If you have any idea where she is or what might have happened to her, please use that information in the description box get that tip into the people that can act on it and maybe help bring this girl home. Now jumping over to the media on this, we're gonna start at KFOR.com. Looks like this is a local NBC affiliate. There is some news coverage on this case. I have found some video clips, um, several articles written online. Admittedly, many of the articles are just an extremely brief overview of the basic case details. They really don't go into it that deeply at all. Um, some of the news reports, in particular the video clips of news reports, are a bit better. Um, her father is certainly, it seems to me like he's trying to be the quarterback in this case, um, trying to really help get the information out there. He pops up in these clips very frequently, uh, which is another part of the reason why I wanted to cover this because you can just see the, um, the pain that this man is, is going through and I'm hoping in some way that we might be able to help him with that. But you'll see what I mean um, with the type of coverage that this story has been getting. Uh, here is a very good example of what a lot of the articles are like. Um, they're basically just echoing all the same information I told you. She's 20. She disappeared on February 2nd, 2016. Uh, she's five foot five, about 120 pounds brown eyes, blonde hair, but she might be wearing black framed glasses and may wear a wig. Um, and then just very simple contact information. They don't even include the case number or the individual investigator here. So that's generally a lot of the coverage about this case that's out there. Uh, thankfully, I bumped into this article at missingpersonsofamerica.com. And before I start on this article, I wanna give a very big shout out to Carla Venata, who wrote all this up, really dug into this case to get a much better understanding of what's truly at play here. And this was written almost a year after she went missing, January 27th of 2017. So uh, with that being said, I'm not going to go over this whole article, but if you only look at one other piece of information besides this video on this case, I highly recommend you make it this article. There's a lot of additional details in here um, that might help jog that memory or get the right question asked of the right person to free up that tip. So please take a look at this article um, if you wanna dive into this case more. Rosemarie Temperley was last seen on February 2nd, 2016, shortly before 4 a.m. by the staff of the Central States ran Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma home where she was a resident. Staff said she went to bed around 10 p.m. but continued to get up about every 45 minutes to an hour throughout the night and into the next morning until around 2.30 a.m. When a staff member went to check on the residents for the 4 a.m. rounds, she found Rose Marie's door locked. She went around through the bathroom that was shared by Rose and another resident and found Rose's room vacant. The window was open and there was a trail of Rose's belongings strung across the yard, which ended near the road at the side of the house. 
Among those belongings were her clothes, her purse, and her acoustic guitar. The worker called the disappearance in to police immediately. We also get another very scary piece of information in all this. Rose's doctor was in the process of adjusting her medications, which made her have schizophrenic episodes going from a zombie-like state of not speaking or responding to having extreme emotional outbursts. She was also being delusional, seeing and talking to people who were not there. What really scares me about that is thinking, um, you know, she was being given this medication, she was going through a change in her medication, already having bad side effects to that, and then somehow she gets out. Um, I highly doubt that if someone did come and pick her up, that they're going to have access to the serious types of medications that she obviously needs for her treatment. So there's a very good chance that um, she could be without her medications at all at this point. And I'm not sure um, what that could do to her in terms of her ability to cope or to understand things that are going on around her. So that's a really scary part of this puzzle for me. A few days prior to Rose's disappearance, she was on the phone with someone. A staff member asked her who she was talking to. She said, my uncle Charles. There's been a funeral in the family and he is coming to get me. When asked if there was anyone named Charles or Charlie in his family, Rose's mom's family, or either of the stepmother's families, Rose's father, John Timperley, replied, there's no Charles or Charlie that we know of. John recalls the last conversation he had with Rose just days prior to her disappearance. According to John, Rose appeared very afraid. She said, Daddy, you're not my father. They're coming for me. They're coming to get me. If you were my father, you would believe me. Due to Rose's schizophrenic state, her doctor had ordered that Rose be admitted into the hospital. She was going to be admitted the following morning once a bed opened. Rose knew she was being transferred and she was unhappy about it. So what makes it really tough when you're looking into this case is you now have to consider that she might be having these episodes um, where she is not dealing in reality. Did this phone call really happen? Does Uncle Charlie really exist? Um, those are the first really big questions for me. I have not been able to find any details about the phone call. Looking at this from an outside perspective, that phone call for me is the linchpin to an identity. So uh, if her family happens to see this, John, if you happen to see this video, um, I would really try to do some footwork into getting the phone records from that home that she was staying at and seeing if you could figure out what that phone number was that called her or that she called. That's another thing that we're not sure of. And quite honestly, with the state of mind that she was in, it might be that the phone call wasn't real. So it's, it's kind of hard, but of the way this story is coming out for me, that thing has to be cleared. I would be looking very hard at that phone conversation. Outside of that, the conversation she has with her father about you not being my father, if that is coming from a place where someone has been uh, grooming her, has been talking to her, trying to convince her to run away, um, that concerns me as well. It could be that uh, this person is manipulating her and she was trying to let her father know those beliefs that, hey, there's, this, there's someone else that's telling me that you're not my real father and my real family is over here and I'm going off with them. Um, but once again, we don't know if this could be some type of psychosis that she's also facing. So really, really tough case. Let's continue with the article here. Rose's biological mother, Shannon Spring, says that she has not seen Rose for the past 10 years. She said she communicated with her over the phone and on FaceTime. I asked her if her boyfriend of two years had ever had any contact with Rose. She told me that he had only ever talked to her once, and that was while Shannon and Rose were talking on FaceTime. I have learned that Rose did have contact with the mother's boyfriend via Facebook Messenger on several occasions. This could be a very interesting wrinkle, and if it wasn't for how the rest of this article uh, was written, I might have not even pointed this out. But by the end of this article, um, the author is very clear that she feels like she's been lied to by several people, um, that she feels like she might have some information that actually helps in this case, and she has submitted that to the authorities. So I don't know if this is part of that information or not, but I find it very interesting that she has pointed out this discrepancy in these stories. 
Um, could it be that this boyfriend or this boyfriend's family, someone he knows, something along those lines has something to do with her disappearance? I think it's something worth looking into. Um, it is a bit of a tough discrepancy, but I can also understand how possibly her mother wouldn't have known that he was communicating with her in those other times. I don't know. Even that just sounds weird to me, guys. I don't know. Um, I think this discrepancy might be pretty important. I think that's why the author left it in. John, her father, was notified by staff about Rose's disappearance around 6 a.m. on the morning of her disappearance. He says he wasn't immediately too concerned due to the fact that Rose had run away in the past and usually came back within two to four hours. So here we have a history of her running away, but what makes this very different outside of the fact of looking at this, you know, over a year and two months later and she's still missing, uh, is she was taking all these items with her. It seems like it was so many items that she was dropping some of them as she went and she makes it to a road that runs alongside of that house and then the trail of items stops. I mean, that really leads me to believe that someone picked her up and you're talking about being picked up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, that seems like it's obviously planned. Uh, I guess that you could assume that perhaps it was someone that didn't know her that might have picked her up, but I don't know. It really feels like there was some, uh, some thought put into this. The article then continues into many frustrations that John has had um, with the authorities on this case. The first time John temporarily spoke with the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office, he says he was told that Rose is an adult and can go missing if she wants. He has felt a lack of concern from them over her disappearance since. Now, you guys have heard me talk about it several times, um, but there are naturally, most of the time, tough feelings that happen between the families of missing people and the authorities. Most of the time, it doesn't happen immediately like this. So this is a little interesting in this case. It's a little bit different. And I'm not quite sure why the authorities wouldn't be kind of extra cautious knowing um, that this is this is a child that is is suffering and is now without medication, uh, was about to be hospitalized the next day. I mean, there is some really big medical-based concerns around all this. Um, but legally, this isn't a child, as I think I just stated. Uh, this is legally an adult that does have the right to uh, disappear on their own accord. Um, I don't know. This is just a really, really tough situation on so many levels. I really feel for her father in this case. Um, even if he would have had cooperation with them early on at, at this point that they're talking about in the article here, I'm pretty sure by this point he would be just as frustrated with them. So um, I'm not sure if anything was really missed in terms of them processing this any different. Um, it's, it's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate that there isn't some type of better training from the law enforcement side for handling families like this, you know? I mean, just let them have some reasonable expectations about what the search is going to be like and how things might go cold, and you never know. I mean, we see cases where people are found years, sometimes decades after they go missing. So you really have to give them at least some piece of, of hope that there's some possibility that this could turn out in a way that that looks much different than things are right now in the darkness of not knowing where your kid has been for the past 14 months. Rose came from a troubled background and she braved through the hardships by smiling and putting on a show. She would literally wear a wig, put on makeup, and tell people to call her by a stage name. Some of the stage names she went by was Candy, Shannon, Sasha, and Amy. Shannon is, of course, her mother's name. Um, the uh, Two of the others are stepmother's names, and no one seems to know where she picked the name Candy from, but I think that's an excellent stage name. Um, while I was looking into this, I did also bump into a YouTube page where she put up uh, three clips doing what kids of the social media age love to do, just singing along with her fa favorite songs and putting it up online. So um, it just, it really... It really tugs at the heartstrings a bit when you see footage like that and you know that the person has been missing for uh, 14 months now and we really have no idea. Is she being taken care of? Is she somewhere where she's being treated well or is something much worse than that happening? Um, I just, I can't imagine being in her dad's shoes. And I highly recommend, once again, that you read this article for yourself and also so you can see where this author kind of takes it by the end because she's obviously struggling with this investigation a lot as well. 
I did find another article at yourultmalgee.com that has some pretty interesting information. Um, this is only a few weeks after she went missing, and it's about two tips that were called in to the police. There have been two possible sightings of the missing woman. Uh, on February 11th, the OCSO received a call at 4.56 p.m. from a delivery service related to Temperley. The reporting person told an officer he had possibly seen the missing girl heading westbound on Gun Club Road from Oklahoma and Okmulgee Streets. The call did not lead to her discovery. And then on Sunday, February 14th, the sheriff's office received a call at 7.51 p.m. from Locust Grove. The caller offered possible new information in the case. The reporting person advised that between 11 and 1 today, Sunday, he saw the missing female Rose Temperley at a convenience store in Locust Grove. He advised she was in a black four-door car, Ford, possibly a Focus. He advised she was with an older, white-haired guy, five foot to five six. After leaving the store, he overheard people talking about the missing female and recognized her from the photo. So far, that lead has not led to finding the woman. What I'm really wondering is if that second lead is actually solid. When we look at the conditions that we do know about her disappearance, the possibility that she might have been groomed by someone that she met online. Obviously, we know she was active, uh, not just on YouTube, but uh, she also had a Facebook page as well. Um, it could be that someone convinced her that, yeah, we're going to go see your Uncle Charlie, and by the way, you're going to come live with me now. So that siding with the four-door Ford um, and the old man with gray hair might turn out to be a bit more important than I've kind of seen it. This is really the only place where I've even seen it covered, um, but there's something in my gut that says that there, that might be an important connection. We then have one of those horrible turns in the case that does happen occasionally. Um, this is just from February 15th of this year, 2017. John Timperley thinks body found in Ulkmulgee could be his missing daughter. Um, of course, you know, he goes out to the scene. Uh, there wasn't much of the body there. From what I understand, it was actually just a torso. But uh, police did hold a press conference a number of days later and identified the person was actually missing from Colorado. Um, they didn't have a solid identification, but they were almost certain that it was someone that was missing from Colorado. So uh, it did not turn out to be his daughter, thankfully, in one regard. And even in this video clip on, on this article, you really see him struggling with I don't want it to be her, but if it is her, at least our questions would be answered and we would know, you know, where she is. So it's a really, this video really puts it in perspective in terms of what a tough time it is for families to go through this. And finally, at TulsaWorld.com, we see that there is an update uh, from also from this year. They had a missing but not forgotten vigil on February 11th. Um, they did a candle lighting. Uh, and there's also a couple of ideas here on what John thinks might have happened. John Timperley has two theories for what might have happened to his daughter. The first, she met up and left with one of the unknown men she had been having inappropriate conversations with online. Now, this is the first time that I have seen that there's at least some acknowledgement that she was having some type of inappropriate conversations online. We don't know any of the details around that. But once again, uh, understanding that there, there seems to be at least, at least we can assume there's a strong medical risk in her not being under some type of managed care. And now we have possibly a phone number that could easily be traced uh, and social media that can also be traced. I don't know if, you know, according to John, it feels like he's not getting a whole lot of help from the police on this. Are they really chasing down those leads? I don't know, but those are in modern days, you know, type modern type of investigations. Those are relatively simple leads to chase down and rule out. So uh, it's possible that that could have happened, but uh, I haven't seen any confirmation that that is actually the case. He also believes it's possible she became delusional, as she sometimes did when she wasn't taking her medication or her dosage needed to be adjusted, and left the home and was picked up while walking down the road. Now, I, you know, you have to consider that possibility, certainly. Um, in any case, 
someone had to help her get away. I mean, she had no means of transportation of her own. Um, I don't know if she might have had money. I mean, I guess potentially if she could have gotten to a bus stop, maybe she could have bought a ticket or something like that. I would like to think that those avenues were all checked out and cleared. Um, but it seems to me like someone helped her get away. So then you have to consider she snuck out around 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't know the road that she got to. I don't know how busy that road is. If it's a main highway, maybe there's traffic that's always coming by on there. Uh, who knows? But I, I still strongly feel that the thought that this was planned, that someone went there at, knowingly to pick her up at that time, seems to be uh, a stronger, it, there's, there's more believability in that for me personally. John Timperley has been frustrated with his options for seeking help. At 20 years old at the time of her disappearance, despite having developmental issues, his daughter was too old to be the subject of an Amber Alert. She was too young for a Silver Alert. Um, now that we know the conditions of an Amber Alert, they would have also needed some information on either the vehicle or the person that had been seen taking her away, and they would have needed to know that she was in imminent danger. I'm not sure if those if those qualifications would have hit, even if she was the right age. And here's a final quote from him. Um, Nobody has any sort of guardianship over her. On one of the news interviews I saw from him, he was even suggesting that um, people that are dealing with children with the developmental disabilities might try to seek getting some level of power of attorney or something along those lines in case their loved one ever goes missing because then you would have a little bit more freedom, especially in terms of freeing up records, you know, medical information, the dental charts and things like that. There is a Facebook page, Let's Find Rose, um, where you can also come and find information. They do a very good job of keeping the media updates happening on here. And as I think I mentioned before, there is a GoFundMe campaign being run for this. It's now been open for 14 months. And um, there are kind of different updates on where they were focusing to uh, gain the funds and what they were going to do with the funds. Uh, the latest update here says that they are now looking to hire a private investigator and a PR firm, hopefully to um, raise the exposure to larger news outlets like CNN, Fox News, etc. Uh, I really think that money towards a private investigator might be money very well spent in this case, particularly if you don't feel like um, the police are really chasing down all these leads, you know, kind of like the Facebook lead I mentioned, the phone lead that I mentioned, uh, possibly reaching out to the reporter that wrote up that piece and had all that additional information. Uh, I think a private investigator would want to reach out to her and get some of that information as well, see if they could process that. So. I think this is a really good cause. Uh, on behalf of myself and my wonderful Patreon supporters, thank you guys so much. We will be donating to this GoFundMe as well. And hopefully, John, um, there's enough people out there that care to put enough money into this thing so you can get that PI. I really think that's a smart next move for you in all of this. So where is Rosemary Timperley? This is where I turn it over to you brain scratchers and I ask that if you have friends in the Oklahoma area, please share this video with them. Let's raise exposure to this case. Uh, let's try to help John uh, get his daughter back, get the help that she needs, and hopefully resume life as normal. Um, also, if you have other theories about what you think might have happened in this case, please be sure to share those in the uh, comment box below. I ask that you please be respectful. Um, you know, whenever I do these videos, the families watch these videos. They, they typically come and watch these videos and sometimes uh, they aren't thrilled if there's a lot of n strong negativity in the comments. So um, just remember that these, these are real lives, folks. This isn't just, uh, and I know most of you guys know this, but it's hard because the audience is always growing and expanding and evolving a bit. So for those of you that are new to the channel, um, just know that I really try to encourage you guys to um, to keep your heart firmly in touch while you're commenting on these cases and always try to be helpful. That's really what we're trying to do here. Um, if it comes down to you wanting to share something that might be tough for other people to hear, to hear uh, there is certainly a way to do that that is respectful and still able to get your point across where others can either support or debate that point. So I just ask that we try to do that. Thank you guys so much for spending a little time with me on Brain Scratch Searchlight today. 
Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you out there, and especially those of you that really try to help out by sharing this video. Get this picture seen by more people. Get it in front of the eyes of your friends and in their minds and in their hearts. And maybe, maybe we can do something to help Rosemary come home. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you on the next show here on the Lord and Arts channel.